Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, I mean over the top beautiful day. Here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, it is Tuesday, October 6, 2020. I believe in the little Christmas elf and I need to get out back to the manure pile from hell as we close up shop here, uh, getting ready to head to Florida. Oh yes, I am Sam Mitchell. This is Collapse Chronicles. And uh, what are we up to today? I want to thank Alert Tribes member <clears throat> Tom Ensalata for sending me uh, the latest essay from uh, journalist Elizabeth, is it Colbert or Colbert? don't know how she prefers her name. She is the <clears throat> author of The Six Mass Extinction. But what she's looking at today, she is, uh, as we all do here on Collapse Chronicles, she is, you know, trying to figure out where this climate is going over the next 30 years. And uh, she's a staff writer at the New... Yorker. So she has come up with three scenarios for the future of climate change. Three scenarios uh, to choose from here. And I'm going to put the link on here, guys. You can read this for yourself because I'm only going to read about half of it. And so you can fill in the blanks. So what she and the New Yorker start off with, you know, it's just getting to the point, guys, where it's kind of like the new David Attenborough uh, documentary. What she does in the first half is, is just rehash, you know, what has brought us to this point. I think we get it. Uh, I, I, I guess, and I kind of feel sorry for editors and publishers a, you know, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, uh, they spend the first half of their limited space, you know, rehashing what we have known. Uh, she says here, you know, she goes back to 1965 talking about all of these doomsday scenarios of uh, climate change over the coming decades. So, uh, yes, little dog, would you, would you figure out a spot? Yes? Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead. I think we've all heard it before, and at some point we're going... Uh, Oh, God, we have to get through the the New Yorker video, I guess, of the week. The challenge of gender-neutral parenting. You know, letting your three-year-old child decide what gender they are. But I'm not going to go down that road here on this channel. Anyway, <clears throat> let's see. Let's get back to, uh, to reality here. All right. Finally, halfway through the, the article, <clears throat> take it away, Elizabeth. What will the earth look like 30 years from now? To a discomforting extent, the future has already been written, which is the first half of this article. There is a great deal of inertia in the climate system. As a result, we have yet to experience the full effects of the CO2 that has been emitted to date. Do you think so, Elizabeth? No matter what happens during the next few decades, it's pretty much guaranteed that glaciers and ice sheets will continue to melt as temperatures and sea levels continue to rise. But, to an extent that, depending on your perspective, is either heartening or horrifying, the future, and not just the next several decades, but of the next several millennia, 
hinges on actions that will be taken by the time today's toddlers reach adulthood. Now, uh, again, this is Elizabeth uh, article. I would reword that, uh, but 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 anyway, we're going to stick with Elizabeth. What's technically referred to as quote dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, close quote, and colloquially known as catastrophe, is warming so dramatic that it is apt to obliterate whole nations, such as the Marshall Islands and the Maldives, and destroy entire ecosystems, such as coral reefs. A host of scientific studies suggest that a temperature increase of two degrees Celsius or more would qualify, you know, as a catastrophe. A great many su studies suggest that warming of one and a half degrees C would be enough to do the trick. At current emissions rates, the one and a half degree threshold will be crossed in about a decade. And, and, and again, I, I've got to break into here as Elizabeth Col Colbert or Colbert knows damn well that, she, that this global average, one and a half or two C or whatever, is not uniform. The globe, every spot on the globe does not rise at an equal rate that there's plenty of areas of the globe led by the Arctic that have already exceeded the two degree C. Uh, so depending on where you are on the planet. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to get off that rabbit hole. Anyone with a brain knows if the entire globe hasn't already hit one and a half C. Uh, depending on the baseline you use, there is, you know, no stopping that ridiculous freight train. Uh, as Drew Schindel, an atmospheric scientist at Duke University, said, quote, No longer can we say the window for action will close soon. We are here now. Close quote. So, how hot, which is to say, how bad will things get? One of the difficulties of making such predictions is that there are so many forms of uncertainty from the geopolitical to the geophysical. No one, for example, knows exactly where various climate tipping points lie. That being said, I will offer three scenarios. This is three scenarios uh, of what the climate's going to look like in 50 years. And guys, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to insult your intelligence. I'm just going to read the, the opening of scenario number one. This is for the hopium smokers. Okay. In one scenario, let's call this blue skies, the world will finally decide to stop waffling and start to bring emissions down more or less immediately. Yes. <coughs> In the U.S., proponents of the Green New Deal have proposed a, quote, 10-year national mobilization uh -huh, in order to meet a hundred percent of the country's power demand, quote, through clean, renewable, and zero emissions energy sources, close quote. Such a timetable is obviously fantastically ambitious, but not for this reason, infeasible. Yes. It, 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 anyway, guys, 
uh, enough. Uh, I, I'm not going to continue with the blue skies scenario. Okay, uh, let's move ahead to scenario number two, which I guess she doesn't give a name to, so I guess we'll call this the gray skies. This is kind of the mid-range one. All right, now that we're creeping back to reality, alternatively, the global emissions could, could continue to grow through the middle of the century, and along with them, global inequality. In this scenario, by 2050, a temperature increase of two degrees Celsius, you know, for the entire planet, two degrees Celsius, meaning uh, a lot more than that in the Arctic and, and other uh, places. Okay. In this scenario, by 2050, a temperature incre increase of two degrees Celsius would, for all intents and purposes, be locked in. It is already locked in, as Elizabeth knows, and probably well before uh, 2050. All right. Developed nations would have, in the next 30 years, constructed storm surge barriers to keep out the seas and erected border walls to keep out refugees. They would also have started to air condition the outdoors. Developing nations, meanwhile, would have been left to fend for themselves. To a certain extent, all of this is already happening. A study published last year um, from Stanford University found that in the past 50 years, warming had slowed economic growth in those parts of the world which have emitted the least carbon, perhaps by as much as 25%. Quoting the study, not only have poor countries not shared in the full benefits of energy consumption, but many have already been made poorer in relative terms by the energy consumption of wealthy countries. Qatar, one of the world's hottest countries and also one of the richest countries, already cools its soccer stadiums and its outdoor malls. We shall see. Okay, let's move to the third scenario. In a third scenario, we'll call this, I guess, the black skies uh, scenario. In, the, in a third scenario, global warming could, by 2050, produce a global conflict that draws in poor nations and rich ones alike. This, too, already seems, to a certain extent, to be taking place. Yes, the worst case scenario, well, this is not the worst case scenario, but uh, in, in, in this one uh, is the worst case scenario, seems to a certain extent to already be taking place. Do you think so, Elizabeth? A significant body of research suggests that the Syrian civil war was caused, at least in part, by a drought that pushed more than a million people out of their villages. The war, which has claimed some 400,000 lives, has, in the course of nearly a decade of bloodshed, involved the U.S., Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. Further droughts in the Middle East are apt to be even more severe and prolonged as are droughts in other volatile regions like the Horn of Africa. It does not seem that it would take too many more Syrian-scale conflicts to destabilize large swaths of the globe. At the very least, climate change, quote, will endanger the stability of the international political order 
and the global trading networks upon which American prosperity rests, close quote, said Michael Clare, an expert on resource competition, um, has written, continuing with Michael Clare, who I have interviewed somewhere here on Collapse Chronicles, quote, as conditions deteriorate, the United States could face an even more perilous outcome, conflict among the great powers themselves, close quote. Uh, anyway, uh, th this is one tiny example of what it could look like. Uh, in, in, in 2050, of course, it could look like this easily uh, in, in 2030. All right. If all of these scenarios appear to be either too unrealistic, meaning to, to any doomer unrealistically small, uh, or too unpleasant, I invite readers to write their own. Here's the one stipulation, it must involve drastic change. Uh, so Book Hermit, you are not allowed to uh, participate in, in Elizabeth Colbert's, Colbert's uh, invitation to write your own doomsday scenario for 2050. All right. Here's the one stipulation, it must involve drastic change. At this point, there is simply no possible future that averts dislocation. Yes. Um, <clears throat> then she talks about the fires out there in the West already turning people into climate refugees, blah, blah, blah. Uh, as Andrew Dessler, a professor of atmospheric sciences at Texas A&M University recently put it, quote, if you don't like all of the climate disasters happening in 2020, I have some bad news for you about the rest of your life, close quote. Billions of people this is back to Elizabeth, billions of people will have to dramatically change the way they live, you know, meaning voluntarily uh, cut back on their uh, environmental footprint. Voluntarily. Billions of people will have to cut back uh, will have to dramatically change the way they live, or the world will change dramatically, or some combination of the two. My experience reporting on climate change, which now spans almost 20 years, has convinced me that the most extreme outcomes are, unfortunately, among the most likely. As the warnings have grown more dire and the consequences of warming more obvious to anyone except Book Hermit, uh, emissions have only increased that much faster. Uh, blah, blah, blah. If this continues, the IPCC projects that by the end of this century, Global temperatures will have risen by almost 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Let's just say that at that point, no amount of air outdoor air conditioning will be sufficient. Do you think so? A few years ago, I interviewed James Hansen for a video project that I was working on. Hansen retired from NASA in 2013, but he has continued to speak out about climate change. He was blunt about the world's failure. When I asked James Hansen 
if he had a message for young people, he said, quote, the simple thing is, I am sorry we are leaving such a fucking mess. Close quote. Apologies from Grandfather James Hansen. He is sorry we are leaving such a fucking mess for uh, his grandchildren and uh, anybody else with grandchildren out there. Can you imagine having grandchildren, right? I, again, guys, if you think I am bad, uh, if I had made the single biggest mistake uh, that I could have made in my life and actually bred, actually brought another human being onto this planet in my life, let's say 30 years ago, and then they ha ha had bred, uh, I would be more than sorry. I would be homicidal. But anyway, uh, just in case you are still of breeding age and, and tuning into this channel, uh, <laughs> if, 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 if I have to look for the number one best decision I have ever made in my entire life, hands down, w w with nothing even closely in second place. It was my decision to get myself sterilized at age 22 for uh, being responsible for bringing a, a, another human onto this planet. Uh, if, if there is anything uh, that I can accomplish in my teeny weeny little participation of whatever it is that I do here on YouTube, if I can convince one person not to breed, if, if I can keep one human being from being added uh, to the hellscape that we are uh, building for ourselves on this planet, I guess uh, all of this time talking to myself has not been entirely wasted, but I am gonna stop talking to myself now and get out there and enjoy this absolutely gorgeous day in the collapse of global industrial civilization by moving piles of manure around. And I highly suggest you get out there and move the piles of bullshit and horseshit while you still can before the pile gets too big to move. Bye, guys. Are you ready to get back to the garden, little dog? <laughs>